Welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast, where we feature conversations with entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and artists. Okay, I want to welcome my uh, good friend here, uh, James O'Keefe, to the Agents of Innovation podcast. Uh, as uh, James and I go way back, but James is the founder and CEO of Project Veritas, which is a nonprofit journalism enterprise uh, that does undercover reporting. You've probably heard of them by now. But James, uh, welcome to the Agents of Innovation podcast. Great to be with you, Francisco. We've known each other a very long time. Yes, we have. And actually, it's funny. One of the things I want to get started with, James, is, is, is sort of how we met. Um, I was working at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, ISI, uh, working with a lot of students on college campuses. And, um, you know, one of, the thing, one of the ways I got there was I had started a conservative student newspaper when I was uh, in college. And so I then worked there and was uh, kind of helping a lot of student groups and uh, student chapters, uh, you know, kind of learn more about ISI. And one of the things I did was I kind of would look at all the newspapers that some of the students were sending in. And one day we got this paper called the Rutgers Centurion and I flipped through it. And you know, at that point I had been working at ISI about six months and I was just like many ISI students. I would call up places like ISI and say, man, that like the leftist indoctrination on these college campuses is crazy. We need some help. We need some books. We need some resources. And after about six months, you know, I just picked up the phone every day and kept hearing that, kept hearing that, kept hearing that. And it was starting to get a little boring, a little monotonous. And then I looked at this uh, young man named James O'Keefe, who was from Rutgers, and his opening editorial said, you know what, actually, college students are uh, very fortunate in college. They're very, uh, and, and, and uh, conservative students, I should say, are very fortunate in college. And, and liberal students are very unfortunate. And uh, uh, that was the first time I kind of heard something like that. And he said, because, you know, you said, I like a good challenge. And, uh, you know, I already know all the, the conservative ideas and all these sorts of things. And so when I, um, you know, when, when I'm on a college campus, I get to now hear the other side of you, the other point of view. And and yet the, the students that are on the left, they're not really learning anything new because they're just getting fed uh, sort of the things they already believe. And so I thought that was really interesting. And I remember reaching out to you by email and saying, hey, uh, I really like this. And I'd love to make a photocopy and send it out to all the um, other conservative groups out there because I think they need to hear this message. This is, this is actually really, really good. So, uh, you know, knowing, I, you know, I didn't know, you know, obviously I didn't know who, who you were going to become and the James O'Keefe today, but uh, knowing that you kind of uh, take this viewpoint, I think, in a lot of things you do where you're, uh, one, you like a good challenge, but you also like to dissect the other side a lot. You know, you like to learn about them and their, their motives and their tactics, and then that helps inform you. So anyway, James, that's how, that's how we first met. But tell us uh, a little bit about that period. Uh, I think this sort of is what activated you in uh, mm -hmm. what you're doing now is when, when you were at Rutgers. So as a college student, uh, tell us a little bit about why you got involved with that. Well, it's great to be with you um, <laughs> in Miami Beach. We're at the Fountain Blue Hotel here, and uh, and uh, I'm, as a qualifying statement, I we had the party of the century last night. So if I'm if I'm fifty percent of how, how I ordinarily am, that's to explain that. But the, the the story of the of how we started, the origin of how this came to be, is 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 pretty interesting. And I think you're right. I remember that the, the Centurion. You you were at ISI, the Collegiate Network, and and it was an it was an column I had written in this paper I started about how I'm so fortunate to be challenged. And you, you looked at that and you said, most people are complaining about the <laughs> right. political correctness, right? They're, they're upset about the censorship. And for me, I always viewed it as a blessing um, in that I enjoy the fight. I enjoy being part of the crusade to, for free speech. And I always viewed it as very stimulating and, and, and uh, the, the collision of these different ideas of Western and non-Western civilization of the First Amendment and those who opposed the First Amendment. Um, but for me, it was always very stimulating. And, and coming full circle, which I've written this new book called American Muckraker. Right here. There it is, and Francisco wrote a book review about it. And uh, actually, as I'm sitting here, The Guardian just put out a book review. It wasn't all positive, but it was somewhat positive. And, and I think there's a choice we have to make in life to, um, to follow our conscience, you know, to, to do the right thing. And the first chapter of this book is called Suffering. And it's about pain. You might say, why, why, why is the first chapter of a book on journalism called suffering? Well, we all, I think we all in life experience pain to some degree or another. We all go through horrible things. And people are complaining, right, at, at, at the, on campuses about the censorship, how horrible it was. But for me, we all experience suffering, but why not follow your conscience doing so? Why not do the right thing? Even if it involves some reputational 
hazard, some some defamation, some character assassination. At least you're, at least you're standing on principle, and and um, and, and you can live with yourself. You know, you're not tortured. So that's how I felt, and now I am able to articulate it better. But at the time, I just felt very strongly to just take a stance. Well, that was, I believe, the fall of 2004 when I read that column by you, and um, you must have been about 19 years old yep. or something, yep. and, uh, maybe a sophomore. And um, but you know, it was very articulate, especially for a 19 year old. And I do remember, if I if I remember correctly, I believe your your headline or something in the in the editorial actually said, "The truth shall set you free." Yes, yes. And, the, the Latin was the Veritas los <laughs> Libra. People say, "Where did I come up with Veritas?" Project Veritas. Well, it was from, I think it was John 8, 3, 2, from the Bible. The truth shall, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The Latin was veritas vos liberabit. And on the bottom of the centurion, there was like, I, I modeled the layout after the National Review. Because mm. I had read the National Review, and I loved how they did their layout and design. So I, Adobe Page Maker at the time, I, I, uh, I we used to call it Adobe Rage Maker, because the thing would always crash. And then Adobe InDesign, and I, and I laid all that out myself. I did all of that. I learned how to... You use layout and design, and on the bottom uh, column in, in italics, I put veritas vos liberati, the truth shall set you free. Yeah, and you know what's funny is you say that because a lot of the students say on the left, they have a lot more resources on college campuses, whether it's the main newspaper or whatever, and all the funding and all these sorts of things. Um, I think what's really interesting as well is that like, you accepted the challenge. Uh, you're a great writer, you're a great thinker, maybe you have some viewpoints you want to express. Uh, but you also had to learn, like you said, in design, right? Layout, that's yep. not really something uh, you probably, but, and then a little bit later, um, so we met months later, I think I was, uh, I think for the first time we met, I was in Princeton, New Jersey, and mm -hmm. you came over. You that's were, right, what Triumph you, Bar. A Triumph Bar, that's right. And uh, it was actually, we had lunch, I think, there or yeah. something. And um, one, of your, one of your colleagues on the Rutgers Centurion joined us. And uh, so that's the first time I met you in person, but I think um, the other interesting thing is uh, maybe it was within that year or so, <laughs> you did something <laughs> totally, uh, innovative, and this is the Agents of Innovation podcast. Uh, you did an undercover video of with the with the Lucky Charms, is what I'm That's referring right. to, and uh, got, with the Project Veritas experience that we saw here, and uh, that was that was a scene, right? The Lucky Charms scene. That's right. In that, and and first of all, I always like to remind people today, especially as you're getting canceled for many platforms, mm -hmm. that video was done before YouTube ever existed. Yeah, I was just about to say that. This was uh, before YouTube, before Twitter, before Instagram, Facebook. For those of you who probably don't know, unless you're in your mid to late 30s, 40s, Facebook in 2004, which is around the time, I actually started the Centurion before Facebook. Yeah. It was just a different world. I mean, there were a few campuses that had it in October of 2004, like Harvard and Yale, Columbia, and Columbia. Maybe, Rutgers yeah. was one of the first twelve, I think, that had it. I don't know if you Maryland had it or wherever you. Not went. at that point. No, I didn't. I didn't get on Facebook till I was about a year into working at ISI. Okay. Yeah. Well, and 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 there certainly wasn't a video option at the time. I mean, there wasn't even video on Twitter until years later. So, I and the iPhone had not come into being, and this is in two thousand three. Most people, those little Nokia, sort of tiny things that you know, you you know, there wasn't even a smartphone. So I had a Kodak digital camera that I think my mother had, no, it was Justine Mertz, one of the college Republicans, and there was a flashing red light when the video option, so I took a piece of duct tape and covered the red light, and you know, this at the time, this is in 2004, I remember being in awe of the fact this thing had like three megapixels or something, and I put this thing on the sort of a shelf like this, and I went into the, the one of the dean, uh, dean of dining services, a woman named Carolyn Knight Cole, with a little Irish Kangol hat, hat and a and a green shirt, and uh, and my colleagues feigned an Irish accent, and we we printed out a copy of what the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education called speech codes. In other words, parts of the campus manual that outlined there are certain things one shall not say to offend people. And of course, it's absurdly written. It's like you can't say, it's very relativist. You can't say anything if it offends somebody, which is unconstitutional, and it's a state university. So, so I can't tell, I don't know who came up with this idea, but it, it's almost like throughout my life, people have said things like at a diner as a joke, and most people just sort of move on. Francis go like, oh, someone should do this. And I was like, wait a second. I think I'm going to do that. That's been like the story of my life. So someone said, yeah, someone should go in there and try to ban Lucky Charms. 
And I said, actually, that's brilliant. So I went in there, and the hardest part for me was I, it was hard to keep a straight face. I, I, I was like... <laughs> well, I remember watching the video, you know, after you did it, and it was hard for me to, you know, not laugh as I'm watching this. I can't oh. believe... And I kept sitting there watching the video thinking that this woman that's, you know, whatever, she was like the multicultural diversity officer or something. Dean of something at the university. Yeah, and, and I kept thinking, she's going to call them out on this any second. But she, you know. <laughs> but that's, but, you know, there's this book by Tom Wolfe called Radical Chic and Mao Mao and the Flat Catchers, which I, you know, I read a year or two later, which perfectly encompassed this confrontation because Tom Wolfe writes about these, these people go into these government offices and sort of Mao Mao them. It was called Mao Maoing, and you're mm -hmm. confronting them with, 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 with uh, racial grievances and there's nothing you can do to oppose it because think of it they can't say that it's absurd it, it would be a violation of their own of their own sense of uh, uh, rules you're making them look to their own book of rules and we're putting the bureaucrats in a bind because if they if they laughed at me I, I would have a I would have a, like a, a civil lawsuit against yeah, them right. but if they banned lucky charms they become a laughing stock so, so they, they chose the lesser of those two evils according to them and they, they told me that they would remove Lucky Charms. Now, there was one moment in this video, and again, this is before Facebook, it was on QuickTime video that we posted to a website, rucenturian.com, where I actually said to them, you know, we're not all short, we have our differences of height, and I'm, try, I'm trying not to laugh. And of course, I do laugh because it's impossible not to, but I turn the laugh into sort of a, sort of a oh, tear sort of <laughs> moment of personal reflection, and, and um, and that was that. I, I that, that that video to this day of all the things I've done, people always bring that up to me. Shockingly. So funny because last night uh, here in Miami Beach, I witnessed this theatrical performance of the Project Veritas experience, really telling your story uh, in an innovative way. But uh, uh, James, you, you you seem you know I know you're uh, like a journalist and a reporter and a muckraker. We're getting into all this, but you you also seem to be an actor. You know, and going back to the days in, in, in the Rutgers Centurion. Uh, you, you, did you have some, some acting experience in, in, as a child? I was in um, Gershwin's Crazy for You when I was 18. For those of you who don't know what that is, George Gershwin, you know, I've got rhythm, I've got music. He's they also put, a singer. They put all the music from Gershwin's songs into a musical, and I saw a little shop of horrors. Now we're really going back. I don't think I've ever spoken about this to anyone because this is really the origin, origin story. I saw a little shop of horrors when I was 15, and I saw Seymour on stage. And I remember thinking, that is so cool. But you, people might say, and I've had some comments on Instagram, he's just an actor, he's just pretending. It's not like that. It, it's more that I'm motivated principally by the arts. What is, and, and I think that to expose things and to show people the, the truth, because this is about truth. I mean, for, for centuries, for, for millennia, people have used theater to show people the truth. And... I could have just given a speech last night. I could have just said all those words you saw on the screen. But images transfix in a way that words don't. Images anesthetize. Images bring to life things in, in a, in a four-dimensional way. And I think that theater, I think that song, I think that rhythm, I think that the, the way that something makes you feel. Most people will not remember much in the end of their life, but they will never forget how things made them feel. So veritas, Latin for truth, um, cinema, we call it cinema verite, the truth at what is typically 24 frames per second, although these days it's 60 frames per second with these new iPhones. It's, there, there's only one truth. There's only one reality. You're not entitled to multiple truths. Right. I think you and I can agree on that. that, that there's, there's only one way of the world. And the modern tragedy is that we, people, people can't agree on facts. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I think that people have turned this political, people have made us into something political. But if people can't agree that, you know, this is a glass of water as opposed to a glass of Coca-Cola, that, that's a tragedy, that, that, that we should all agree on that this is right. a glass of water. So, so when I was getting started, I was primarily motivated as an artist to expose the way things are, to get people on videotape being who they are, and I think my thespian nature, my artistic nature has, has allowed me to do that in a way that if I was motivated by politics and power, I, I don't think that we would have been as successful. You know, what's interesting, James, is uh, on the Agents of Innovation podcast, I've made a conscious effort not to have anything political really on this because I just, 
you know, I'm really, I'm really more interested in people's uh, in entrepreneurship, uh, helping inspire maybe people to be entrepreneurs, and also, but really kind of learning people's journeys. And you know, the way you you and I first connected and that we've known each other for so long has been through somewhat of this prism of politics. Um, I think you and I have both been more in the ideas side of it, the policy for me, the media for you for the most part, but not really like, you know, you and I are not really the kind of people that ever really want to run for office or go yeah. into that whole thing, right? Uh, so, but so we've more been on the idea side, but you know, it's funny, I was reading this book a few weeks ago um, and I it really, that's what it clicked on me. You know what, I, I need to have James on because this is something completely beyond politics and, and anything I think even you've done and this is such a great I really got to tell you it's a it's a great um, and I'm not just saying that you I mean this is your third book your other two were great they were they were telling your stories but this is something that I think is so good that I think it should be assigned in every college of journalism school in the country hey guys my team could you take that book <laughs> and put it on the Amazon page yeah. <laughs> no because because even if they disagree with your <laughs> tactics or your methods or who you are or what you stand for um, it's a it's a point of view and especially in the innovation of journalism, of what you're talking about, and you go through any me every medium of journalism. I love that you to talk about the way you talk about that in the book because when I mean, you go all the way back to from the printing press yeah. to the yeah. hidden video camera that might be on your button uh, to the smartphone and everything in between. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how the medium is the message and how you and Project Veritas uh, are using different well, mediums. Marshall McLuhan was the Canadian philosopher who came up with this idea that the medium is the message that the way we we express ourselves changes how we think. It really does, and the chapter two of this book is called Medium. This book is very unique. It's got over 700 footnotes. I've exhausted, I read, it took me five years to write this book, and, and, and I like what you said because it's true. Oftentimes a publisher will edit your words and take something out. I put it back in. They kept taking, I put it back in. This book, I, I, I wrote the book I wanted to write. Um, this is not a political book. If you want to read right-wing orthodoxy, this is not for you. If you want to read punditry, this is not for you. In the publishing business, content is not king. You can put, you know, poop in a box, and if you're a famous person, people will buy your book. This is not that. This is a, a very intellectual, extremely um, thought-provoking treatise on journalism ethics and history. And I've organized each chapter by different themes. So the first chapter is suffering, the second chapter is medium, third chapter is deception, fourth chapter is secrecy. And in this chapter of medium, I wrote about the history of the printed word, and then in the last 30 to 40 years, journalism has really changed, and most of it is because of the rise of what I call the oligarchy, the collection, the, the consolidation of all information through just a few companies, the decimation of the newspapers, uh, the for-profit motive of, of, of the media has really decimated. There is no investigative journalism bureaus really anywhere. There was, a, there was a media company show up uh, last night, and he told me there's really one person left that does uh, investigative reporting at his company, and it's a billion dollar company. One person doing investigative, so there's no, so, so really what this, at the center to the, the evolution of the medium is this notion that journalism, it, investigative journalism is printing what someone else does not want printed. Yeah. And all of modern, you call it journalism in quotes, publishes what they do want printed. In other words, the government gives you something off the record, you publish it. The pharmaceutical company tells you something, you, you publish it unskeptical. And it's that, it's that printing the authorized information versus the unauthorized information. And it's gotten so bad now that we can't get any unauthorized information. The American founders the whole idea of the, the Jeffersonian concept of the First Amendment was to publish unauthorized information. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the First Amendment, and that's why Jefferson thought that newspapers are more important than government. Yeah. So we, we talk about the history of that in this book. So, James, on the, on the medium, and, and, and let's, just, let's talk a little bit more about the muckraker. Sure. This is called American Muckraker, your book. And um, so you, dis you kind of, I think, uh, distinguish yourself more as a muckraker. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe that's a type of journalist or, or a type of reporting, but tell us uh, what you mean by muckraker and maybe a little bit of the, the history of muckraking uh, in the U.S. Well, muckraker was a term coined, I think, by Teddy Roosevelt in 1906 in a, in, a, in, a, in a speech or a booklet, Pilgrim's Progress, and he talks about this idea of raking the muck, which is, a, which is an apt metaphor for stirring up the stuff. You know, you're, 
you're, you're exposing this, this filth and in the early 20th century, these muckrakers like Upton Sinclair and Nellie Bly, they would go undercover in insane asylums and meatpacking plants. Upton Sinclair, most of these guys were socialists. People don't know that. They mm-hmm. actually were ideological people. They, Upton Sinclair, when he exposed the jungle in Chicago, his goal was not just to expose the, you know, the, the conditions of your food supply. He, he was trying to get people in their head and he hit them in their stomach, as it, as it was said. And, and uh, Lincoln Stevens, these were sort of utopians. They wanted to expose, but they, but they did it in a, and they, they published unauthorized information. And Upton Sinclair was viciously attacked by the media for what he did. In fact, his follow-up book, which most people don't even know he wrote, was called The Brass Check. Hmm. And in that book, he, 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 he kind of, I found a, a, a distant cousin in him because he wrote about how tortured he was by the New York Times and the press in New York that he was attacked. And I think it comes down to this idea of a muckraker is someone who publish, uh, publishes information about powerful people that those people don't want published, for whatever reason. And a lot of our newspapers, and even at the time, if the, you look at the New York Times, when they sent a reporter to the Soviet Union, Durante, Durante reported what the Soviet Union wanted reported. Mm. And that's a slippery slope, because what you're doing is you're acting as an ombudsman, a representative, and in extreme cases, like in North Korea, it's a Potemkin village. You're just publishing yeah. what the powers of propaganda, and and that's what that's what a muckraker really does. It, it 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 cuts the curtain, it opens the curtain, and exposes an unauthorized information, and you are viciously and savagely attacked <clears throat> for doing that. So that's why I call it American muckraker. Yeah. Now, James, I want to go back in time a little bit. So you graduate from Rutgers University. Uh, what do you do next uh, from Rutgers? And I know that between the time you graduated, there was probably a four or five year period before uh, you did something monumental with the Acorn investigation. I know you did some other things in between though, but uh, I also know you during those times because I got some phone calls from you. Uh, you know, Francisco, can you connect me to someone? Francisco, can you help? You know, I'm just like, I, I, don't know who, I don't know what you're trying to do here. Uh, who, who can envision this? But um, uh, but I know that those those were those were there were definitely a few years of struggle before actually figuring out what your career was going to be, which I think a lot of young people today, you know, when they're in their twenties, they graduate college. There's not like a set path as much as there was maybe for those who graduated college thirty or forty years ago. Um, so tell us what 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 happened. In well, I graduated years. June two thousand six in yeah. New Jersey, and the Acorn story was in um, about you know I filmed it in July two thousand nine. So there was about a three year period of time where I was sort of trying to find myself. I graduated 21, and, and I was, you know, in full, you know, be transparent, you were one of my closest friends at the time, and you, you witnessed that, you know, development. Um, what did I do in those three years? Uh, I did a little bit of everything. I, I, I tried my hand at law school. I went to law school for a year, and I'm glad I did, because I learned, because now we've got a lot of lawyers working for us. But in, in, the law, in law school, I learned the idea of IRAC, which is issue, rule, analysis, conclusion. So it's the legal thinking. It's, it's spot the issue, find out what the, the law says, analyze it. So that was really important for me. And I did not know at the time. It's sort of like what Steve Jobs says about he took a year of college and learned a penmanship course. Well, yeah. I took a year in law school and learned how to think like a lawyer. I learned criminal procedure and, and uh, t- the law of torts. And now we, we go through so many legal battles, the law kind of surrounds us, and we can talk about more about that. I, I, I was in New York City for a year, and I was getting, I was in, getting a, uh, again, part-time Master's of Business Administration. Uh, I was working during the day at a, at a company like Hulu, which does the streaming, but it was for documentary films. And then I, um, i trying to think what else I did. I met, I met with a mutual friend of ours, Evan, Mm-hmm. And, got, and got a tiny amount of money to make a, a satirical video about bailout. This was 2008. Yes. So I went around like with a camera and a, and a van that said bailout prize patrol. And I confronted Goldman Sachs executives with these big checks, these, these outrageous checks. And I was trying, and then I met Lila Rose, this girl at UCLA, then 18 years old. And I went into Planned Parenthood with a camcorder. And that was like the, I know the Acorn was the big one, but that was the one that kind of was, okay, this is a national story. This is, this is, 
they, they fired these Planned Parenthood workers for, for telling us to get an illegal abortion in California, and Planned Parenthood sent me a cease and desist letter. And that was my first test in life, you get tested. Planned Parenthood asked me to take those videos off YouTube. Rather than do so, I, I sent the letter to, to someone who knew Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly put Lila Rose on the air and Planned Parenthood backed down because of this diminutive 18-year-old girl. It was bad optics mm -hmm. for them to try to put her in jail. And now Lila's doing great things with live action. Sort, I mean, I'd, I'd say probably trained by you early on and, and kind of taking a lot of what you do, but applying it to the abortion I think she, industry. I think she trained me, and Lila was like this extremely godly, I mean, wise beyond her years. I was not really pro I wasn't. I want to say I wasn't pro life, but I wasn't really. Un I didn't understand the issue, and she taught me more of that side. And I think I taught her more of the uh, the other side. And we, we were a dynamic duo. At the time. So then, uh, two thousand nine is the big acorn thing. You get you get uh, contacted by what Hannah Giles and tell, yes. us, tell us how that unfolded and and then the process of, of you know what you did what how you caught them and, yeah. and how um, well just how you like the, the uh, lucky charms at the diner so yeah. Hannah sends me a message this girl I'd never met before I guess she was an intern at National Journalism Center or one of these uh, conservative organizations and she sent me a Facebook message much like we get Instagram DMs today or tips Hannah sent me a Facebook message and, and in this conversation she said what if girls went in as addressed as prostitutes into Acorn and my first reaction was that it's kind of like a secret shopper, like a sting operation. Right. You're trying to test people, which is what I did at the time with the Planned Parenthood sting and the Lucky Charms thing. And, and we were kind of going back and forth with these messages. Um, and the, the thespian and me said, well, maybe there should be a pimp. Initially, there were going to be multiple prostitutes go in, multiple pimps go in. Uh, in fact, when we went out and did this, there was another woman that was with us in the vehicle but she decided not to go into the office. She was, I, I don't remember exactly what happened. Stage fright? Stage fright. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't going to be the pimp. I was going to cast this other guy, but he, he bat, bowed out at the last minute. People were kind of flaky. And, and uh, the critics would insist that there were right-wing billionaires funding this. This was, this was I mean, it's, all, it's so hard to believe what I'm about to say that people don't believe it, but it is the truth. We spent about thirteen hundred dollars of our own money. Um, I was very broke, as you as you know, because you knew me at the time. I was in debt from college and law school, although not horribly, because I went to an in-state university. And I, 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 I met up with Hannah, first time ever meeting her, and she was from Miami. She went to Florida Atlantic University. Florida International. Florida, I'm sorry. Uh, Florida, I went to Florida Atlantic. Florida, yes. I get confused between those two. <laughs> and she shows up and. And I, I drive down to D.C. from New Jersey. She's an intern. And she's wearing a, a sarong and this leather. You have to see. Just Google James O'Keefe pimp or acorn pimp and you'll know what I'm talking about. And she's wearing this this halter top and this, like it, it, it's effectively a thong with stilettos. And she's like, let's go. And the next morning we drive to Baltimore, inner city Baltimore. It was about an hour and a half drive from D.C., and we go into this office, and I'm and I got my camera in a satin tie with a wire going down to this box. It's about the size of an iPhone. It sticks in my pocket. It's called a DVR. This is in 2009. And I and I and I walk in, and I'm like, "This is my, you know, she's a prostitute, lady of the night. They call it lady of the night in Baltimore. I never, I did not know that. And I, I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, "No, we have these, you know, this prostitution business." And and this woman goes, "Hey, Shira, who wants to get some tax advice?" And they bring out this accountant, <laughs> this tax advisor, to teach me how to disguise the, the prostitution business as dancing. The woman goes, dancing, you could say that, performing artist, which you are, so you're not lying. And she goes, stop calling yourself a prostitute. And she takes out the nine, uh, 1099 tax. Now, I'm in a state of, you could say, shock, because I, I thought at best they would like sort of tell us not to tell anyone. But she was giving me advice. And this is these are federal Work, they're getting like hundreds of millions of dollars of tax money. So the first thing I'm thinking is, wow. And the second thing I'm thinking is, is this thing on? Because my body, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're wearing the camera, so I have to be like this. When, yeah. when I have to be like this. So my first thought is, I hope the battery didn't die. And I look yeah. down and it's still, okay, it's still on. And then I think, and this is the mischievous thespian in me. I go, I need to escalate it. But we weren't prepared 
to escalate it anymore because we never thought that they would go on. So then on the spot, Hannah and I sit there and go, there's actually 13 underage El Salvadorian prostitutes. And the first video came out and this was such a big story. It was on the front page of every, you know, CNN was talking about it constantly. CNN called my phone 75 times that day. And I did not pick up the phone. Andrew said, do not pick up that phone because they're gonna try to destroy you, assassinate you, make it about you. So I ignored all the media. Day one, they said it was an isolated incident. CNN said it was isolated. Falled right into the trap. Day two, we released, um, I think it was DC. Day three, we released Brooklyn. And they got caught. And day four, the House of Representatives voted to defund ACORN. On day five, the United States Senate voted to defund ACORN 83 to seven in a democratically controlled Senate. And by the seventh day, Barack Obama, the then Democratic president of the United States, signed legislation voting to defund ACORN, all because two kids from the cast of High School Musical 3 with the grandmother's chinchilla coat and a video camera from Best Buy <laughs> walked into an ACORN office. And you also caught on in popular media. I know John Stewart did some bits on this and uh, South Park, right, uh, had some information. So you're really penetrating um, uh, the culture at this point with this story. Andrew Breitbart called it taking the penthouse. He said, you've just taken the, what did he say? John Stewart did this amazing Daily Show bit. I don't think the Daily Show would ever do anything. Like Trevor Noah is a hack. He's not. Mm -hmm. John Stewart was like 70-30. He was like liberal, but he was a classical liberal. And yeah. I respect him for that. Trevor Noah, Trevor Noah is a party hack. He's just a Democrat party hack. Yeah. You're not allowed to go on late night anymore. And, and you can't it's so Manichaean now. In 2009, it was different. Jon Stewart did this amazing show where he looked into the camera and he goes, where the hell were you journalists? Look at these two people, O'Keefe and Giles. Look at what they did. Where the, this is Jon Stewart saying this yeah. into the video camera. He goes, where were all the media here? It wasn't the NBC to catch a predator guy. It wasn't Chris Hansen. It was these two. And he points to a picture of me and and then there was South Park did a show where Butters, Butters was like, it's a kissing contest. I thought Acorn helps pimps and the bitches. And this is, this is on South Park. So for me, the week, it, I was a different person. I mean, I was the same person, but within the span of 10 days, I go from nothing, South Park. And El Andrew Breitbart had said it was like taking a, a, an elevator to the penthouse of, of media. Yeah. And, and that was the obviously the big one. Well, you know, and, and as someone who, you know, was your friend for, I don't know, seven years or something at this point, six years, um, seeing that happen and see, I mean, Acorn, I had kind of heard about Acorn, and I'm probably a little more in the know and politically and things like that. The average American, 99% right. of Americans probably didn't know what Acorn was. Right. Probably for 30 years, uh, there were all sorts of people trying to expose Acorn and get them defunded for all sorts of things, but this was like a whole nother level. The whole, the entire American public, for the most part, learned about ACORN in that span of a week, um, uh, to the point that it got through all this popular culture, to the point that the President of the United States, and the you know, like you just said, the Democrats uh, in Congress defunded it. Uh, I mean, these people were getting hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And maybe even billions had we not done this, because right. there was a congressional bill that Daryl Issa talked about, they were allocated as much as five billion yeah. Five billion to zero because of these video recordings. And Andrew had called it the Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib was the thing in the Iraq war where people were being tortured and it was horrible. Uh, but, well, Andrew Piper had a, had a way with words and he called this video expose the Abu Ghraib of the Great Society. Yeah. The Abu Ghraib of Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society initiatives because these workers were, I guess they were trying to help these criminals um, or these people pretending to be criminals do this and and they were not phased at all right. I mean in fact in the Brooklyn office I found it odd there was a line of people that actually were trying to get housing loan assistance and when the workers found that that my colleague was a lady of the night they're like come to the front of the line it was like it was the Abu Ghraib but I also learned I mean we could we could talk about this for hours but in a, in a minute I'll say how hard I got hit it's like a boxing. This is a championship prize fight. That's the story of my life and certainly the story of this book. They hit me back hard. I mean, reputationally, with jail, but before we before we get to the New Orleans thing, just just the amount of defamation and attacks 
and 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 the way that they used they manipulated. There was a there was a story in California. The attorney general then Jerry Brown. So Jerry Brown uh, was the governor of California, and he issued a report, you know, vindicating Acorn. And it was like that. This was the most psychologically traumatizing thing for me to endure because the videos were real. There were nothing was edited out of context. They did indeed say these things. They were upset that I didn't wear the co my pimp coat into some of the offices. But the words of, out of their mouths was. Was, was true. Nothing was edited. In fact, we posted the full raw audio and transcripts, yeah. and Andrew was insistent. I'm glad we did so. The New York Times had issued an article saying they went through the full raw video and found nothing was taken out of The New York Times, uh, Clark Hoyt, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, did that. But Jerry Brown issued a report and, and said that um, the videos were selectively edited. Of course, he meant that in, in, a, in a hyperbolic way. Yes, they were edited, but nothing was taken out of context. So it was just so manipulative for him to say that. Um, and it was unnecessary. Um, and they also said that they didn't break the law. And he's right. And the reason why is because... That's Jerry Brown coming right There he now. is yeah. coming for me right now. <laughs> Nothing like uh, Miami Beach here. Is because we were playing the, I was playing the role of a pimp. And therefore, it's, a, it's called an inchoate crime. It, it's, it's, it would have been impossible for them to break the law because there wasn't any actual real prostitution. You see? So for them to, to, to vindicate the organization on the law, I get it, but it was certainly immoral and unethical what they were saying and doing. But 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 there was but this was taken by the press. And to this day, if you go to Wikipedia, mm -hmm. there's there's like ten paragraphs, Acorn story debunked. And, and this was sort of the, 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 the change in our media ecosystem because obviously it wasn't debunked. It two things can be true. You can engage in horribly unethical and immoral and disgusting misconduct without breaking the law. But 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 that was that was really psychologically difficult for me because it was so manipulative for them to for the media to to trumpet from the rooftops that these workers now suddenly it became these workers did nothing wrong. Yeah. So it went from they didn't break the law to another person would cite the, this saying they did nothing that they didn't do anything wrong. And then it went from they did nothing wrong to James lied about it. Right. You see, that, you see how that happens? Sorts of things. Yes. It was like this, and, and we all know this happens. I mean, any any consumer of news see this happens every day, but but that's the anatomy of a lie. And and, it, and, and for me, it was um, it was extremely difficult for me to accept this um, because I, I thought to myself, well, how how am I going to repair my reputation after this? Well, interesting because I believe it was the maybe around September of two thousand nine that uh, those those videos became public light, um, and I also believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that Breitbart he had Breitbart.com, but he started BigGovernment.com, and I think Acorn was the launch of that, yep. the Acorn investigation. So it was a it was a great move for for Breitbart to do that, um, and then uh, I remember seeing you actually, uh, funny enough, in Asheville, North Carolina, at the State Policy Network conference because they wanted to come bring you to speak. And James, I had known you at this point five years, and I had gone to some of these yeah. you know, think tank conferences before, and you, me, and a couple of our, our mutual friends were just sitting in the lobby having a conversation, and I couldn't believe like every single person wanted to come up and shake your hand, and yeah. you were like a known entity now, and uh, we actually had to like leave uh, because it was becoming too like intrusive to our. Not as bad as last night. though. No, no. So, so that was the beginning. That was the beginning of of something, and I've seen like multiple iterations of this. Well, you, well, you've up. seen. I mean, yeah. people need to understand that Francisco's known me <laughs> since I was nineteen. Uh, you know, he's one of a handful of people in my life that, and what I've seen is that there's been ups and downs in life, and we yeah. don't have time. Yes, yes. But we have limited time, so I don't. I don't want to tell every story. You choose what's what you well, want. Well, I, I do. I do. But, but I want to say one more thing. Yeah. In these ups and downs, I want to say this because I, I don't want to tell every New Orleans this this because it would take hours. But what I found is that you, 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 I'm glad that that happened to me because I've seen I saw a lot of people during the downs that what I call the nadir, the the the, the uh, incarceration in New Orleans, and it was all it was all I was all vindicated eventually, um, but. I, I got to figure out who my friends really were. And I also think that those horrible experiences have now engendered trust to me. The sources come to us because they know that they can trust me. Because the, the FBI doesn't raid people unless those people are a threat. 
You know, they don't do things to people. And if I was embraced by the powers that be, like the New York Times is, if I was getting Pulitzer Prizes and Pfizer was cocktailing with me, I mean, this is like, I'm not making this up, like Pfizer and the FBI and the New York Times are all like in concert. Then do you really think that these sources would trust me? Right. So in some weird way, those horrible things that happened to me in the years subsequent to ACORN have really engendered trust with me. And I also think the ups and downs have kind of, you know, strengthened me and made me who I am. And, 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 and I'm happy that I went through that. At the time, I, I thought my life was over, especially after my, my jailing in New Orleans. And I sort of thought, there's no more after this. Some folks, I'm not going to say who, but you, it, your mouth would drop if I told you their names thought that I should retire and quit. They thought that I should give up. The one man who did have my back was Rush Limbaugh. He was always someone who went on the Ripley show and was like, oh, there's more to the story here, folks. Uh, this O'Keefe thing, I know there's something more. You know, he was always someone who was very intuitive and uh, you know, he, he was someone who never stopped defending. And, and as someone who, who worked in the conservative movement you know, uh, for 15 years myself, um, I saw this as well, right? I just mentioned going to this think tank conference where everybody was praising you uh, two months after the ACORN investigation and then you get arrested in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. we, we, are, you know, we don't have to retell that whole no. story. Uh, but the attack knives came obviously mm -hmm. from the obvious sources, but even people on the right in the movement, James O'Keefe has gone too far. What's he like doing there's right? one guy, and, and I'm not trying to pick on because I, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't have no ill will, I have no hard feelings, right. but just as an example, what's uh, Media Research Center, Brent right, Mazzella, yeah, came remember. out with the knives, and it was it was it was one of the. There are many different types of pain, but Alexander Solzhenitsyn writes in the Gulag Archipelago that when he was suffering in the Gulag, you know, people talk we're going to the Gulags, well, not that veil hyperbole, but let's go back to the Gulags for a minute. And he's in the Soviet Union in in these Gulags in Siberia, and he says that the, the feeling of the prisoners going on hunger strike, where they. They all stick together and no one eats anything. It gives them power over the prison guards when you go on a hunger strike. Now the prisoners have power and he, they feel their souls are, are, are ascending because they, are, they, they have freedom, the freedom to tell the guards, I don't want that food. And it, it sounds horrible, but Solzhenitsyn describes even though they were starving to death, they felt you know, their souls were ascending. But then one of the prisoner, or one of the prisoners out of 100 people decided to eat a, a, a piece of bread. And Solzhenitsyn describes that the, the psychological torment of that one person defecting mm. from the ranks was worse than the feeling of starvation. Wow. And now that's an extreme example. But in my case, seeing people that were supposed allies of this crusade for truth and justice defect to the New York Times and get positive ink by getting a shot at me, a blow at me, another person, again, I have no ill will, I have no hard feelings, I'm just trying to tell you what happened. Glenn Beck and Andrew Breitbart evidently did not like each other. They were, I don't know what it was, whether it was a contract dispute, I don't know. And I got caught in between this, and, and Glenn Beck and, and the Blaze viciously attacked us after the NPR story and got, and got praised by Time Magazine and, I don't know, the New York Times, and there was thousands of, hundreds of articles and well, Google News, and it was very, oh, it was painful, and 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 and, and I and I and I wish I, I wish they had reached out to me. I wish they had talked to me about that because there wasn't any selective editing. Yeah, you know. Well, you know, it's interesting because you know you saw some of those lows. You know, we uh, you mentioned the in Louisiana getting arrested uh, later that year. You decide to start your own organization, yes. Project Veritas. Point of disclosure: yes. I served on the board, was chairman of the board but for no about longer. four years. <laughs> yes. I tried to get off as, as, as much as I could. It's Actually, okay. you know, it was interesting is uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't in your same position, but I think, you know, you got some friends of yours, including me, on the board I originally. Yeah. And I remember feeling a little small version of that because I was thinking how much we're open to liability, right? And, yeah. and, and things like that. And so I. Rightfully so. Rightfully yeah, so. And I was thinking, like, you know, so it's a lot to take on that risk. And I don't know what you're going to be doing. I don't know what the investigations are going to be, right? We're on the board. Uh, but, but anyway. Um, but through that, I got to see a lot of things. You mentioned the NPR story. I think that was, to, in my view, always, that was really the first story as an organization, as Project Veritas, that was like the big story. Um, internally, I can say it was also one where Project Veritas started gaining a lot of supporters, 
you know, financial support. Is I think the Acorn story? No, NPR. No, Acorn. Oh, Acorn oh, was oh. before Project Veritas. The NPR, the yeah. M- Acorn was like, you know, you had Ben Smith, you know, people at the time saying, yeah. well, this is 15 minutes of fame. So the NPR story, and this is, was last night, we, we put it over um, Moby's music, uh, God Over Water, which is, this is, NPR was like, oh my God, he's not going away. Right. NPR was like, this guy's, I mean, CNN did a story at the time, this is in March of 2011, some some year and a half late. Only a year and a half after the Acorn story, and only a year and one month after my arrest. Think about how soon this was. That CNN, and I remember the, the segment on CNN, this is, I'm quoting the anchor on CNN now. You're looking at a sting operation by people who know how to do it. O'Keefe met with NPR executives pretending to be agents of the Muslim Education Action Center and met in this posh Georgetown eatery with a hidden camera inside. And we met with the vice president of NPR, my colleagues. I was not actually there. My colleagues were dressed like Muslim you know, fundamentalists and, and presented themselves as, uh, as uh, extremists. And, 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 you know, had elicited anti-Semitic statements from NPR top executives and other horrible things about the American people, like racist, white, gun-toting people is what they said about Tea Party members. This story was the thing, Francisco, that, that, really, that really created Project Veritas. It wasn't Acorn. Acorn, right. they thought, was one and done. People actually thought I should have retired after the Acorn story. And they wondered why I didn't. They said, they actually gave me advice. Why do you continue doing this? You should have just done your little, your little thing, good little puppy. You did your job, now go home. I said, I'm not going to stop. And it was Jim Eltringham, a Leadership Institute employee, who wrote a blog article about this in, in response to people's arguments that I should have retired. And he said, in a way that I couldn't say it, he said, James, good on James for continuing on, even though it was so risky. The NPR story, we, we suddenly got like, I don't know, a couple hundred donors yeah, that were writing thousand dollar checks. Within like a week or and something. And then within yeah. one year, we went from zero, our budget became about $200,000 a year in 2011 after that NPR story. Yeah, so uh, James, when you did the ACORN, that was, pr- that was pre-Project Veritas, you did that before you formed the organization. And I, re- I remember, I was not one of those people that said, don't go on, but I will remember always telling you, James, you'll never do anything as big as Acorn. And I was trying to give you a compliment in a way. This yeah. was so big. There's no way that anything could top this. And then when NPR happened, the way I looked at it was, yeah. you, for Acorn, almost no Americans knew what Acorn was. You, you expose an organization to them. NPR, almost every American knows what NPR is. And they were like, whoa, like this is an organization that we think is like kind of like objective journalism. You know, They have that nice soft tone every morning as you're driving to work. Um, and, and here they were you know, totally against you know, at least half the American people. Um, so I think it was you exposed something. You, it was it was a great momentum for Project Veritas. You've continued to just outdo it. I mean, over the years, <laughs> I just can't even believe it. I just sit back and, well, I think he's done the biggest thing ever now. But uh, I'm just waiting for the next one. You know, well, well, when the pimp <laughs> thing, it was like I, I remember I probably told six people if I was going to do it. And it's this funny thing in life because we can all relate to this. Like I remember my grandfather was alive at the time. And he saw me like getting ready. He's like, "What the hell are you doing? What are you? What are you doing?" I remember Hannah. I won't mention names, but some people, including some at the Heritage Foundation, said, "You're going to ruin your life if you dress up like this hooker." And then after it happened, like everyone's writing fundraising letters, trying to raise money off of it. Like people are trying to raise money. People are so funny, and um, it's been. You know, that's just the way human nature is. I think there's doers, and I think there's critics. And most people are, are non-doers in this life. I would say 99.999% people just don't do anything. They talk. Yeah. And then you have 0.001% of people who actually take action. And the mission of our organization has always been to find the 0.001% and to not worry about the, what the other people think. Well, you know, obviously I have a, uh, this, this podcast, I interview a lot of entrepreneurs. And um, I, one thing I've learned is entrepreneurs are people of action. They're people who take risks. But also, they, I've never met an entrepreneur that hasn't failed, you know, right. most of the time, many times before they hit some point of success. So uh, for those that may be listening or watching, um, what can you say about, I mean, the suffering you've gone through, the failures you've gone through, the low points is right. really what I'm looking at, um, and, and what, what you might say to them to get through those low points um, uh, to, to, to maybe get to the next part of their life that they don't know yet about. They don't know what's going to happen. That's my favorite question, actually. The, 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 my favorite, and I have the book here on my iPad. I'm going to pull up a few quotes. My favorite 
chapter in this book, American Muckraker, is called Suffering. And you might say, well, James, you know, isn't that a little self-aggrandizing for you to compare your plight to suffering? I say, well, yes and no, because I think that the reputational hazards are what people fear most. Yeah. I think people sometimes fear they're losing their reputation more than their actual life. If you don't believe me, then let me ask you a question. How many people do you know in Washington, D.C., who have the courage or the stones to blow the whistle on all that crap that's going on? Not many, right? We know a lot of people who exhibit uh, what uh, military uh, philosophers would describe as physical courage. Mm -hmm. Von Clausewitz, you, you know, you, there are many of our heroes, and those, that heroism is, is indescribably heroic for them to, to ch charge up a hill with a bayonet and give up their life. But how many people in the Department of Justice do you know that are willing to speak up about what we know is unethical and illegal behavior? Nobody. Mm -hmm. because, because to risk incarceration, to risk defamation, is what most humans will do anything to avoid. So I realized, and I've, I mean, I'm not making this up. This book took me five years to write. I went, my team, will, my, some of the folks in this room here, off the camera, are, are with me in Miami. They were with me in the mountains in the Adirondacks. I spent weeks in the mountains. You might say, where do you have the time to do that? Well, every year I'll take about two weeks, three weeks, to write this book for five years. Not exaggerating. And I would sit there and think, what do I need to do to convince people to do this? And then I realized I have to write a chapter about what you go through. And I, and I write about this so-called nadir. Nadir is a word that means lowest point. And just like any survival of psychological abuse, the, the muckraker over time starts to realize a new kind of superpower. You're reborn through this baptism by fire, invigorated by this knowledge that you're no longer a slave to fear. And fear, you are afraid. I mean, after the FBI raided me, it was like, yeah, I was, I was in a state of, I guess you could say trauma. But it doesn't affect your decision making. And, and no one can really deprive you of anything. In fact, They've attacked us in, in so viciously and so savagely that the New York Times argued in court that we were, quote, libel-proof. They said to the judge, they've said such horrible things about him that he doesn't even have a reputation anymore. They, they lost that argument in court. <laughs> but but you, you, you go through this process where you are said by declarations from credible journalists, credible not by virtue of the evidence they present, but by virtue of their own decree that they are indeed credible because they say so. And anonymous sources are able to contradict incontrovertible evidence. And you, you're deprived of, of your reputation so much that effectively it brings a new type of freedom. And, 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 and just like any survivor of psychological abuse, you're reborn, like a Christian is reborn. I mean this. Until it becomes to the point where people say, well, do you fear for your life? And the answer is no, because you start to live like you're dying. You literally start to live like you have no fear of death. You are not, you are no longer afraid of them. And if you think about it, why are we afraid of them? You think about it, we're afraid of the New York Times. And you might say, I'm not, but you are, you are. You say, oh, I'm not afraid of the, of the press. Who cares what they think? Well, you know what? I'm calling a spade a spade. People in the conservative movement are indeed a little afraid of what the press thinks of them. Hmm. And, and that the evidence is self-evident because they're unwilling to speak truths unspoken for fear of having their Instagram accounts shadow banned. We wouldn't want to lose our Instagram account, would we? But the moment you actually stop caring about what they think is actually the, the, is when your ascent, I call it the ascent, using Solzhenitsyn's term from Gulag Archipelago, that's when you're actually uh, uh, free to be effective and then you start to repent, but not before the state. You know, you have nothing to repent before the state and its laws. You've broken no laws. You've never spoke. You've never lied, but you kind of you kind of become free. So I so it, this is very psychological. It's very philosophical. It, there's some political science in it, but effectively, I, I describe for the American people the journey that I've taken, the journey that I've watched the whistleblowers take in what they do, and what you realize is that there's life after whistleblowing. You survive. And when you survive and you keep going, that's when you really can make a difference. My, my, my job is not to get everyone to do this. It's to get, if I can get like a few dozen people to do it a year, 
we can we can really prevent society. Well, problems. I remember at the beginning of Project Veritas, you know, obviously you were the you've, you've been the face of Project Veritas and the face of this entire type of journalism in a sense, um, and Acorn and NPR and all these sorts of things, right? But I remember uh, having a conversation that this can't be about James O'Keefe. Uh, this Project Veritas, it has to because if because then if someone takes you out, you know, literally or just reputationally or like whatever, then 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 it's over, right? But you got to you got to build like an army of people. And what I've really seen, this is actually, I was telling a friend this the other night, I said, you know, uh, what's interesting is I think people in the movement or in the know or in the media, right, they know James O'Keefe. Like, we're, they're talking about these videos about James O'Keefe. When I meet random people who start talking about your videos, people who are not in politics, they're not in media, they're just living their normal lives. When they start talking about your videos, to be honest with you, uh, what I've seen is they talk. They actually use the word Project Veritas instead of James O'Keefe. Yeah, it changed. Yeah. Something, something changed. Something there. changed there, and um, yeah. and it's. I think that's a really great thing. And also, the other thing I've seen you guys do that have uh, really evolved is it's not just about your investigative reporters. You've got more of them than just you, of course. Uh, but it's also you have people coming to you now. You have this whole whistleblower thing. Uh, I listened. I was at your whistleblower lunch yesterday and listened to some of these actual what did you whistleblowers. Think about it? it was fantastic. But what, so, what some of them said was, they're not political people at all. Most no. of these people, they were just like, I knew, I didn't know anywhere else to take my story except Project Veritas. Yeah, yeah. And and, and and you know, and then of course, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, heightened tensions during the political season and the election and the fallout from the election. But a lot of the things that we witnessed yesterday at this whistleblower lunch had nothing to do with the election. Um, they were just people, you know, exposing all sorts of things with businesses now, now to do with the pandemic and the vaccines and all these sorts of things. But I thought, thought that was an interesting turn and, and a really uh, good success point for Project Veritas well, to get to I'm there. I'm glad that you brought up the political thing again because I didn't touch on this. And I think it's important to say that there's another chapter in this book called Character. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, I, and I, I, uh, I interviewed a few psychologists and I said, what does it take to do this? What type of human being do you have to be? And there's this very interesting characteristics because sometimes I ask people I'm very much a person who asks for feedback and I, and I interviewed this psychologist who's really gifted and and he gave me these this list and I looked at it and one of the qualities was you have to have people who are politically disinterested and you might go wait a second mm -hmm. Pfizer whistleblower is politically disinterested and what he said to me is that oddly it's you, you, you can't be political because politics if you think about what politics is it's effectively, it's effectively doing good to one's friends and harm to one's enemies. Mm -hmm. And if that's really what motivates you, like if you're like a football team, I just want to hurt the other guy. Well, you're not really a journalist. You're not really a truth teller. What happens when the facts run anathema to your own football team? Right. Then, then it's no longer about the pursuit of truth. It's about the pursuit of power. So politics is about the pursuit of power. But these people are about the pursuit of And this sounds like corny but it's real i mean the, the the people that do this are not doing it for political reasons of course they'll they'll say that they are because the people that are our critics are projecting their own politics onto us they're they're accusing us of that which they are guilty of because that's the soup that they swim in that's all they understand mm -hmm. people people that don't understand the truth are not going to look at it through that lens so so the psychologist told me you know and and you know that uh that, that people that do this are, are have, a, have a deep justice complex. And then if you're just pursuing power without that sense of justice, well, that just leads to tyranny. So one of the, it's gonna be hard for you to believe me saying this, but one of the things that makes a whistleblower do what they do or a journalist do what they do is this idea that you're not motivated by politics. You're, you're motivated by a desire to really show people what's going on. Yeah, and I think a lot of people who end up being whistleblowers, like the ones you know that have come to Project Veritas, they just, they were doing their jobs. They were just doing something that they thought was good and decent and bringing home a paycheck. Uh, and by the way, they're bringing home a paycheck. Now they may have to lose a paycheck, right? So they're really sacrificing something, but they were just disgusted by what they saw and they couldn't be a part of it anymore. So I think that was interesting. James, uh, kind of turning on, a, just the, uh, so we can kind of, uh, you know, get a few last questions in here for you. I know you've been very generous with your time. Um, first of all, in that suffering, um, I, one of the things uh, you talk about, you know, being free, being reborn, yeah. baptism by fire, uh, in the Project Veritas experience, theatrical performance I witnessed last night, uh, there was that point where, you know, you, you, uh, you sat there, I think, at Duquesne with the New York Times yes. guy, and, and then you realized that 
you know, you had had him on a bit of, at least some little bit of a pedestal because he was with the New York Times, thinking he would at least congratulate you for something. Uh, once he didn't, you know, you, you seem like to just let go of like even placing any importance in him, and and then the scene in the in the experience was, uh, you know, you just being reborn, like reborn. you were free, you know, and it was it was great. I think it was very very captivating. I think you um, liked that moment. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. The other moment I liked, and and I think it was a, maybe a little earlier in the theatrical performance was when you really went interior to yourself and you portrayed uh, a scene where you're 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 praying in church. Yeah. And. Um, and I feel like in that scene in, in the church, tell me a little bit more about how your faith has guided you through this. I know you've talked about some really great people as well, like Solzhenitsyn right. and others, uh, uh, and how and how maybe you've worked it out a little bit through through all of uh, the, well, the suffering. You know, they say there's nothing new under the sun, and, yeah. and there are a couple books that that like like 1984, which we read in high school, but it's like every line of that book, every line of Gulag Archipelago, in fact. I took Solzhenitsyn's writings and I sort of put them in italics in the first chapter, and I and I and I wrote about you know this this uh, let me give you an example of uh, from the point of this is Solzhenitsyn talking quote from that point of view our torturers have been punished most horribly of all they are turning into swine they are departing downward from humanity they are the ones who are truly suffering so I so. So I took Solzhenitsyn's writing, which are universal human truths about Solzhenitsyn won the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. for surviving the Soviet Union and writing about it. In fact, I don't even think we have any video from the gulags. But I realized that it was the people that are doing this corruption, these people that are torturing me, well, they're the ones that are being tortured. Yeah. Dean Baquet is being tortured. I mean, I had Jane Mayer of The New Yorker write me an email last week. This is a New, York, uh, New Yorker reporter in an email, like, I won a journalism award. Like, I am no journalist. And I said, you know what? That's not a good thing, Jane, in this day and age. That's not a good thing. I quoted a guy named uh, Gary, Gary, uh, uh, the author of To Kill a Messenger, who said, quote, I was winning awards, getting raises, lecturing college classes, appearing on TV shows, and judging journalism contests. And then I wrote some stories that made me realize how sadly misplaced my bliss had been. The reason I'd enjoyed such smooth sailing so long was not because I was good at my job. The truth was, in all those years, I hadn't written anything important enough to suppress. So the people that are the, 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 the so-called successful ones, the mm -hmm. prosecutors, the, the journalists, the, the business executives who think that we think that they have a good, and, and so they may have all this power, but they're actually the ones being tortured. And when you realize that, like I did in Pittsburgh, when I went to shake Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the New York Times Hand, and he cowered away, cowered down like a little scared dog. And I remember thinking to myself, that, that I, why, would I want, why would I want to seek their approval? It was a really amazing moment, and it was, uh, that's how I was reborn. Yeah, so uh, James, you know, I know in the book you also go through the different mediums, and we, we go all the way forward to the hidden video, the investigative video, What's, what I find really interesting, because you, you do like an exceedingly great job of pinpointing different points in American history in this, 1991, the, um, the beating of Rodney King was done by a citizen, the report, the video that we all know, it's, uh, it's grained in our minds in some ways if we lived through that period, um, it, was, it was a citizen with a camcorder, right? and I think it's interesting, cause I, don't, you know, I don't even think about the camcorder as something, but you know, somewhere between the eight, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, every almost every American um, uh, was it was equipped now with the possibility of a camcorder. Right. You just be your own. You know, you're filming your time at Disney World or whatever it is. Um, and somebody caught them beating that, and that brought it showed. You said it showed the effectiveness of what uh, what video could do by by a citizen, not just by a news person. Well, you know, the the underpinning to all this is the idea that transformity is tra you know, as Matt Tierman says, trend. Uh, transparency is transformative. Yeah. Um, also, Gunter Walruf, undercover journalist, 1970, said, quote, to describe reality precisely is an essential step towards transforming it. It's a very important statement. Very similar yeah. to Matt Tierman's Open the Books motto. To define reality precisely is an essential um, step to transforming. It actually goes back to the Constitution. The idea that information is accountability. So Rodney King being beaten by cops in 91 
because of that video camera. If that video camera was not there, would we had, would we had seen the reaction we saw? So, so yeah, I, I do my best in this very ambitious chapter of this book. I go back to the printing press, the VCR, the video camera, and then iPhones, and now we have the consolidation of tech and finally uh, libel lawsuits. I kind of trace this idea of how the medium has, has changed how we see reality. And to quote Marshall McLuhan, how the means by which we process information changes how we see the world. But at the end of the day, there's only one reality. You yeah. can't have multiple realities. Now, also, you know, you talk, you, you do talk about how the camera can be manipulated to lie as well. We see the news, yeah. the news media do it all the time, right? What they talk about, what images they're showing while they're talking about something totally different, right? Um, and then we have the hidden video camera. Some people, and you actually have a whole chapter here on deception. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because. Uh, over the years, as your work has progressed, I know I've had friends and others who say, you know, what he does is he's lying to people or this or that, he's deceiving, you know, things like that. Uh, well, you know, I think, you, I think you're kind of working that out in this book. That's what I kind of see myself. Um, and I, I feel like, and, and tell me, you know, if I'm wrong or, or maybe you can further explain this, I feel like you've been in this, Project Veritas is at the cutting edge of hidden video camera investigative reporting that I think maybe in this book you're trying to... Um, to, to apply or maybe create some standards of ethics of, oh, yeah. of how you well, go also, about doing well, that. I mean, this is the deception thing is critical yeah. because it's a question of relative deception. If your job is to tell the truth to the audience and you represent, you're representing yourself honestly with your subject, you will oftentimes tell untruths to your audience. Mm -hmm. So like, hi, I'm from the Washington Post, Mr. Defense Department. Tell me about all the fraud you're committing. Now they're going to give you some, some company line. They're going to give you a falsehood that you will then publish in the Washington Post. See, then you're lying to millions of people. So it's a question of relative deception. And I, and, I, and I literally read, I probably read about 50 papers on ethics. I mean, serious ethicists. And, I, and what I discovered was that deceit is always wrong, the con Immanuel Kantian categorical mm -hmm. imperative, but we don't live in that world. You know, deceit is wrong, but, but there are many circumstances in journalism in which deceit is less wrong than other possible courses of action. I'm talking about deceiving your subject. Not Never deceive the people. Never lie to, when you're broadcasting a story. You never want to lie to the people. But sometimes you have to use pretense with your subject, okay? In other words, I have to present myself as something I'm not to you in order to elicit information so that I can tell the truth to the people. Now, you only have these two choices. Now, obviously, it's not lying because you're, 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 you're using a form of guerrilla theater to, to get the truth. So, but the critical thing that we never do is deceive the audience. And the other thing I learned about myself, which took me a long time to learn, this took me a decade, is this whole idea of espionage. In espionage, there are no rules. Anything goes. In other words, spies, real spies, will say and do anything for power. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond deception. They'll, they'll make stuff up, they'll plant, do blackmail, whatever. We, the journalist operates in the public interest. And while there is an overlap, we do, use disguise and sometimes we set up fake websites we do that for the public interest we do that for for the public's right to know so that we can elicit and obtain the secret information and the, and the final thing i learned in all my meditating and writing is that the thing about a journalist is that we can't keep secrets because if i keep secrets i'm doing the thing i'm a hypocrite i'm doing the thing i i'm investigating and um, the only thing that we can keep secret is the names of our donors. That's uh, under the Supreme Court, United States for NAACP versus Alabama. And we keep the identity of our whistleblowers secret. Everything else, transparent. That's great. Um, so, James, you, uh, you know, over the course of the years, it's, it's also been interesting to see your, your rise in, um, in, your, in your fame, in a sense, right? Um, and, and, and how people know you, and I've now been with you in, uh, norm, you know, obviously at, a, at an event where it's a Project Veritas event or maybe some other event where people know who you are, you're known entity, you're on the billing, they're coming up, they want their books signed, they want to meet you, they want to take a picture, uh, but, but people now recognize you in, in public life in a lot of different circumstances. I've, I've been with you in, <laughs> in random places where I, I'm surprised people noticed you, you know, and, and uh, how do you kind of deal with that and also the, the sense of the security issues that, that um, that you now deal with with different threats to you because of, of some of the things you've exposed? I, I, I think this is probably the harder things for me to deal with, which is the <clears throat> fame aspects. And I don't like having my picture taken, but I can't really tell people no. Mm -hmm. 
So someone gave me advice, which is to try to find something enjoyable about it, like even for a split second. Or rather than people, what people, what people will always do is say, can I get a picture? They'll always ask that question. And I never understood that question because you're taking up my time by asking the question, why don't you just take the damn picture? So they'll take 15 seconds asking permission. They'll still three times. And they'll say, I'm so, you're so busy, I'm so sorry, you're so important, but can I get your picture? It's like, because they don't know what to say. So they're trying to like create a moment of, I guess, rapport with you. Yeah. And at a certain point, it's like, this could all be solved if you just take the picture. <laughs> and I know this sounds like white, you know, champagne problems, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> first world problems. But, but it, it, I mean, imagine, imagine being in a room for, in, you know, and 500 people want to take a photograph. And this, this, the world was not like this 20 years ago. Right. There was no Instagram. Uh, there was no ago. smartphone. There yeah. was no iPhone 10 years right. ago. So people used to live their lives, and now things exist to end up on Instagram. People don't live. They just, they, it's like, it's all about the moment. If it's not on Instagram, it doesn't exist. That, right? That, right, that's what Marshall McLuhan says. So I, 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 this is actually the hardest thing for me, and I, there is a way to get around it for me. It was this. You have to, like, instead of they saying, can I get a picture, you say, you're the one that requests the picture. Let's get a picture. So, <laughs> so if I'm the one, yeah, let's do it. If I, if I own it, then, then I'm then I'm not unhappy because I've made the decision to get the picture. Um, and of course, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to sound like a curmudgeon. I love our, our fans and I love our people and I love the fact that we have these supporters and I, and I can't do this without them. Without, I can't do this without support and I can't do without the amazing people out there. But certainly the, the, uh, the, the public, uh, the, the adulation that I receive is, is sometimes not easy and I've had to learn to deal with that. Well, and on the flip side, uh, the threats that you might have, and I feel like I can't remember what your, your best. You have so many dang stories coming out all the time. There was a story just recently, a couple weeks ago, and and then you testified before Congress that week. Anthony Anthony Fauci and the, the Fauci thing with, with the DARPA documents. And I remember you put out a video or something after you testified, and I, I think it was a little tongue in cheek, but a little tongue in cheek. But yeah. it was uh, so uh, yeah, you know, um, I definitely am not uh, planning to commit suicide. I'm very happy with my life, or something like that, right? Because you know, everybody's going off the Epstein thing and everything. But uh, but I do get you know a lot of people who ask, you know, is James, is James concerned about that? I know you just said you're not a slave to fear and you don't fear for your life and things like right. that. But how do you kind of deal with something? Well, you know, people say, do you fear for your life? It's it's such a tough question to answer. Yeah, well, you you can answer it truthfully, but whether you well, however you answer it, it'll come across wrong, because if you, you, again. Being honest, I, I guess the more, if you really think about it, it's really a question about fear. The question is effectively, aren't you afraid? Mm -hmm. You should be afraid. People, the, what underlying that question is one ought to be afraid. I reject the premise. Because yes, you could bask in the, in the fear that there's a marginal risk to your life or, or a small risk. There is always, we could die crossing the street, mm -hmm. okay? We could die of cancer next year. It's possible that someone could hurt you, but when people ask, "Should aren't you afraid for your?" I reject the premise of the question. Whether I answer in the affirmative or negative, I'm going to sound prideful or self-aggrandizing. The best I can tell you is, we take steps. I'm not going to tell you on the record or right. on the air what those steps are. We do have security, and we, and we do exercise caution, and we're mindful of it. But if I was really that afraid, there wouldn't be a Project Veritas at all. In fact, right. the safest thing to do is to stop. If I really wanted to protect myself, I should just give up. Mm -hmm. Because that's the most important way to, to, to safeguard Well, myself. you know, it's so funny because so many people, that's also a lot of entrepreneurs, right? To go out and start your own company, to do your own business, you know, whatever, it's, it takes a lot of risk. That's actually why I called my new company I started last year, Fearless Journey. Good. And, Good uh, and, and then when I was reading this book, I said, dang it, this is the most fearless person I know. Uh, I should get him on this podcast. Uh, he, he's been on a heck of a fearless journey. Uh, I mentioned before that that first uh, video, the Lucky Charms one you created, was pre-YouTube, basically pre-Facebook. Um, but now, you know, you, you even talk about this in the book about how so many people put so much stock in these social media companies, even just taking pictures, right? It ends up on Instagram. Um, you've been deplatformed by Twitter, even Project Veritas has. Uh, you've had a, a Facebook and I think Instagram are restricted. Like I can't tag you on Facebook, yeah. uh, things like that. And um, it but creates a perverse incentive but such that people don't want to do the thing for fear of being unable to be tagged. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because the big tech companies are like, okay, you you, yeah. you say this, we're gonna we're gonna remove you, and we know that is a whole part of your life now. Uh, is this is this social media? But you um, you said in this book. Uh, something like, if his stories are strong enough, referring to the muckraker, yep. uh, people will talk about them. Yep. 
And I think that's so true. And James, I have to give a little side story here because you sent me an advanced copy of this book a couple weeks ago. And I was finishing it in a cigar lounge mm -hmm. in uh, South Florida here. And, you know, I was probably in there an hour by myself. And these two guys that were sitting across uh, on another couch said to me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I see you've been reading and really engrossed in that book for like the last hour. Um, what, what is it there that you're reading? And, you know, I didn't know who these people were or whatever, but I just said, well, you know, I'm just reading this book by James O'Keefe of Project Veritas. That's all I said. One of them then started going into some of your stories. Oh, yeah, I saw their Project Veritas' story about this. And we, then it led us literally, we're in a half hour conversation about the media and how it manipulates us all the time. We went to this whole thing. Anyway, so it was interesting. And they said, oh, well, well, sorry to interrupt you. How much longer do you have in that book? I said, actually, I'm on the last chapter. Mm. And, uh, and I, they said, okay. So I went back to finish it. And that's when I actually, literally about five minutes later, read these words. If his stories are strong enough, people will talk about that. Right. And it was almost like, in my, you know, I'm a very uh, faithful person. I thought, it's almost like that was planned for those people to say that to me at that moment. So I could then read these words with more. Those meaning. are very important yeah. words, and I'm glad that you highlighted them because effectively, what that means is to quote the late Viacom founder: "Content is king." In other yeah. words, if the stories are powerful enough, they'll just find their way out on the platforms. Like our story on the the DARPA documents that you mentioned, the, the Anthony Fauci issue. Those documents were so powerful that it, it trended number one on Twitter. I'm not even yeah. on Twitter. I'm not even right. on Twitter. So it's like if it's like like the Rodney King, you know, video was so powerful that. These things, when they're when they're really powerful, and it's it's hard to ignore. And I know you've got different mediums to get your message out through newsletters and emails and texts and things like that. Yeah. And so you've been very innovative. In distribution saying, by proxy. I'm gonna yeah, distribution by proxy. I'm gonna get this stuff out every other way. Uh, so James, this is an amazing book. Uh, you've been on a, quite a journey. Uh, I've known you now 18 years. We'll we'll have to see you maybe 18 years from now um, where where you're at. Uh, but honestly, you've made a hell of a difference. And uh, you know everybody's got to get this book, American Muckraker. I mean, like I'll, I'll say it again, like. If you're a journalist, uh, if you're studying journalism, uh, if you're teaching journalism, uh, this, this is a must read because you know James really goes through all of the history of the different mediums and, and, and a new challenge because we do live in this age of where we have less privacy. Um, we're giving up our privacy you know, voluntarily through all of our social media accounts and uh, all this stuff. But you know, there's, there's video cameras everywhere. I mean, you know, I've been living in Guatemala City the last year. And it's a very surveilled society because there, there's security uh, issues in, in some places. So, um, you know, but I, but I think uh, we've given up so much freedom and privacy and that you explore that in this book. And I think the way you also get to uh, how journalists cover stories today and how they can through, you know, through videos and undercover investigations. It's, it's really fantastic. So people got to read this book, American Mutt Raker. But thanks, uh, James, for being on the Agents of Innovation podcast. And I'll give you some last words here. I think we, we, we covered a lot of good ground, and, and I think that uh, um, I keep going back to the fear, frankly. I, I, I think that that com conversation about the, um, the fear and um, what's going through my head right now is the uh, people's, people need to not be afraid, and, and, and I hope they put more value on the other things in life. You're, you're, you're a person of faith, as am I, and I think that uh, uh, to follow your conscience and to, and to tell the truth and to do the right thing is more important now than ever. And I do think, and I am very optimistic, I'm not a cynic, I, a lot of people are. And I think that if people just tell the truth and follow their conscience and we have more good people do, do this whistleblowing and, and uh, not be so afraid about what the consequences will be, I think we'll live in a better world and I think that we can prevent society's collapse. Uh, societies have collapsed throughout history, uh, but I think we can prevent society's collapse by Getting people unauthorized information, so they have the, the they they have the informed consent yeah. to make decisions. Well, that's that's great, and, and James, I've always known you as a as a person with uh, with strong moral foundations, and everything you do, I think you know you just talked about that being uh, listening to your conscience, and I think we all can do that no matter what type of work we're mm -hmm. in. And um, so, thank you so much again for being an agent of innovation and inspiring us with your fearless journey. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you.